I love Nate Killian, though we have a standing argument. I tend to think coffee shouldn't taste like fruit and vegetables. <clears throat> Nate's of a different generation. Oh, for the future of America. Right. Hey, welcome to homecoming! So excited to have you in the house! I'm sorry, I just, you know what, I love Sunday mornings. <clears throat> Does, thank you, Marilyn. You and I are on the same page. Hey, this morning we got free food. We got scavenger hunt. We got bouncy houses. We got an opportunity to meet people, do spectacular ministries. Find a way to engage. If you really want to grow in your faith, it's going to move beyond this room. It's going to move beyond this room into a faith group, into a ministry team, into the community around us. It's the progression of our growth in Jesus Christ. And so we're encouraging you today Take the scavenger hunt, grab a passport, go around and meet the ministries of the church. Find a way that you can serve. And here's something to do, because we're kind of like winding down on the renovation part of this whole big project. At some point, stand in the commons, the big room out there, look up the art project. <clears throat> At first, I wasn't sure if I liked it. I'm not a contemporary art guy. I skipped that wing of the MFA, and that's not to be offended, you know. I just like my art to look like people, you know. It's just me. It's just me. But when you stand underneath that and you look up, what you're going to see is you're going to see the three crosses of Calvary. Calvary is the name of the hill where Jesus was crucified, and he was crucified with three crosses. And when you stand and you look up, you're going to see the three crosses of Calvary always over our head in the common. Each of the crosses looks different because you all come to Christ different. We bring to Jesus our own struggles in our own form looking like us. And he receives us at that place and makes possible a way home to the Father. So anytime, whatever you're struggling in life, no matter what you bring into this building, you can stand in the center of the commons and you can look up and you can think, I'm welcome at the cross on the hill of Calvary. Isn't that awesome? Right? That's so amazing. I, I love it. All right? There you go. And, all right? Trumpet sound. Two weeks from today, the return of second service. So for you late morning people who want to go get your bougie coffee before you go to church, you can show up at 1030 and there'll be a service for you in two weeks, 9 and 1030. Full Faith Kids programming at 9, Faith Kids programming from pre-K below. And Mike Dion, I saw you, will have an outdoor service with an iPad. <clears throat> in the back lot for anybody who still misses that. There you go. We are on a fun journey as we've come back in the building. We've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew, reconnecting with Jesus Christ, discovering the Matthew that uh, discovering the Jesus that Matthew knew, someone who was personally trained and mentored by Jesus Christ. It's been a remarkable journey, and we're going to finish the whole Gospel. It's going to take us a while to do that. Now, we're on this one part where we've been looking at a series of events in Jesus' life, and embedded in these events are clues. Now, I don't know about you, but as a kid, since I was a kid, I've always loved a good mystery. I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. I'm a big Benedict Cumberbatch fan, right? <clears throat> From Sherlock Holmes to Doctor Strange. I'm a geek. What can I say? And I hold that up because geeks now rule the world. <clears throat> Now, in, the, in all of what I love about Sherlock Holmes, I've never forgotten this quote. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And what it taught me is, like, let the clues speak for themselves. Don't direct them. Don't bring your bias. Let the clues speak for yourself. I brought that to my faith. And as I began to understand the Bible and to pull it apart, especially in my grad work, as we get down into the, like, the original languages and the cultural in, by, uh, influences that were in it, all these clues that the people would have seen in Matthew's day, I've become more convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. So we're going to move, continue moving forward. We're going to look at a real fun story. Because Matthew, throughout his whole gospel, is really trying to ask you one question. Could this be the Son of God? I think that was Matthew's question. And he's sharing his journey to help you answer that question for yourself. But like every important question, you've got to enter into it thoughtfully. Don't just walk away from it. Really engage it, because Jesus asks important questions. 
He challenges our worldview. He helps us to see things differently. Today we're going to look at two stories. It's a story within a story. It's a wonderful little mystery of Jesus. And we're going to look at how Jesus breaks the rules. We're going to hear how a government worker discovered something unexpected. <clears throat> and I'm going to touch on an important question. Why doesn't God always answer my prayers that way? How's that? That's a little challenging. By the way, it's Nick's birthday today. So everyone, when you see Nick Remen song, wish him a happy birthday. <laughs> Nick is uh, a little north of 25. <clears throat> so God, thank you that we have this opportunity to be here this morning. God, I just so love speaking about Jesus. And what I want is for you to fill my mouth with your breath. It's like the song said, the breath of my lungs, Lord, give praise to you. So, Lord, when I speak this morning, would you direct my thoughts? Would you guide my words and guard them? Would you open up people's hearts and minds to receive it? Will you challenge people gently, lovingly? Will you shake them awake? And will you help them to see things they've never seen before and to walk out of this place different in their journey with Christ? God, I love you. Amen. So, look, we're going to take a look at this. I'm going to take you through this story quickly because it's a great story. But I want to take a look at it from multiple witnesses. So here's what Matthew just lays out. So while he was saying this, the synagogue leader came, knelt before him, and said, My daughter's just died, but come and put your hand on her and she'll live. Jesus got up, went with him, and so did the disciples. Okay. Just, as, just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak, and she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at this moment. And when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. But the crowd had been put outside. He went in, took the girl by the hand. She got up. News of this spread throughout the region. Don't you love how Matthew just like, oh, yeah, this little girl was dead. And then Jesus went in, picked her up, and then went on his way. And you're like, wait a minute, back up. Can we rewind that a little bit? Can we see how that played out differently? <coughs> Matthew condenses a story that Mark elaborates on. So there's four gospel accounts in our New Testament that talk about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark seems to have been kind of like a, a, an important source material for the, Matthew and Luke to use. As they unpackaged this, sometimes they edited Mark down because Matthew had a different purpose. He's kind of the guy who is like doing his own thing. Yeah, well, then this woman came up, touched him, and then Jesus healed this little girl, went on his way, and goes back to his thing. Because he wants to take you on a train of thought in a different direction. Mark loves to unpack the action. That's why Mark is always a great... A great gospel to read. So we're going to look at Mark's account and figure out what did Mark include that Matthew left out. It's always a good thing to do. So Mark writes, a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, by the way, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come, lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Hear the desperation in his voice? And Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Love it. Because what Mark presents is a, is a little bit more electricity and emotion. For Mark, it's a desperate dad, breaking through a crowd of people, falling at the feet of Jesus, pleading with him for his daughter, who's got this terrible illness that's just draining her life out from her. And so Mark tells you how the dad is just brimming with emotion. But he's not just an ordinary person. This guy is a synagogue leader. He's a leader in their faith community. The whole community would have recognized him. He was a religious leader. And what you get from Matthew and from Mark is that these religious leaders were at odds with Jesus. There was times they confronted Jesus, they argued with Jesus, and ar Jesus argued with them, and they had conflict for a man of that standing in his community, coming out of that profession to break through a crowd and to fall at the feet of Jesus is to show you how desperate he is. Because isn't that what suffering does? Sometimes suffering drives us to desperate actions. We're willing to lay our reputation aside just to get God to hear us. And that's what he presents for us. But he's not the only desperate person in the story. Because Mark goes on and says, the woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. 12 years. 
Can you imagine praying for 12 years, desperately crying out to God, change me, heal me, do something to make my situation different? Because to be a woman who was bleeding for 12 years had tremendous social impact. This is the first century. <clears throat> and they didn't have the medicine we had. And they had a little understanding of infectious disease. And if you're a woman and you were bleeding, they just stayed away from blood. It made you what they considered unclean, which meant the world around you avoided you, people would not touch you, and you couldn't walk into the worship areas to worship God. Because they were afraid of the blood and the infection. Think of how we were in the beginning stages of COVID. And we just figured, well, that's how she was living for 12 years, isolated, anxious, rejected, fearful, wondering when this was going to kill her, cut off from the people she loved, unable to worship with her community with God. And he mocked her and said she had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but got no better. Medicine failed her, and her finances had run out. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up from behind him through the crowd and to touch his robe, for she thought to herself, I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. This is a sign of how desperate this woman is because this poor woman is willing to go into the public, break through a crowd. Every single person she touched would then become unclean because she had touched them, including Jesus. Do you understand the desperation she has? She's willing to spark up the ire and anger of a community against her because the bleeding has lasted so long. She's so desperate that she'll do anything. Have you ever been in that moment of suffering where you just push decorum aside? You want to grab a doctor and shake him? You want to pick up a phone and yell at somebody? You willing to crash into a crowd to demand to be heard? Here's a woman who's willing to crash in because of her suffering just to touch Jesus. She is at the end of her rope. Suffering does this to us. Now, we're going to move on with the story. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Jesus only says five statements in this whole story. Sometimes... It's the concise manner in which they represent Jesus speaking that has power to it and poignancy. So I'm going to read to you, but as I read to you, let's just going to focus on the five things that Jesus says. So, immediately the bleeding stopped. She could feel in her body that she'd been healed of a terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around the crowd and he said, Who touched my robe? And the disciples said, Look at the crowd. How can you ask who touched me? You understand what happens? A miracle has just happened. Twelve years of suffering have come to an end for this woman. It's a huge miracle. There's only two people in the crowd who understand a miracle that's happened. Jesus and a woman who has been released of it. After a score year, score of years of this horrible suffering. And Jesus says, who touched my robe? Now here's the thing. If you're in the woman's perspective, you're probably terrified because she knows that Jesus, that Jesus realizes that she touched him. She's probably thinking, I'm going to get torn out in front of this whole crowd of people. But Jesus persists despite the obstacles. And you know why? That's why I think Jesus did. We're going to see it. I think Jesus wanted to look her in the face and to let her know that she was known and loved by God. For 12 years of unanswered prayers, of rejection from the community, of isolation and anxiety, Jesus wanted to stop the world for one person and just say, I know who you are, and I love you. Was, now Mark goes on and says, but she kept on looking around. He kept looking around to see who had done it. And the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, what a beautiful little phrase. He didn't say woman. He didn't even ask her name. He looked at this woman and he called her daughter. It's a term of affection and of intimacy. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. And in a sense, he's saying, thank you for trusting me. You're healed. Go now in peace. Your suffering is over. Jesus wanted to talk to her so she could find hope. She could find acceptance. 
and she could discover peace. To a woman who had been physically suffering in a humiliating fashion, drained of all her cash, considered unclean by her society, unable to join in her community with worship, and probably questioning God's compassion, Jesus stopped the world and said, I know your name. Thank you for trusting me. You are healed. Now discover the peace that passes all understanding and go back into your world. This is the compassion. See see what the, the story is kind of pulling out from us? The compassion of Christ, right? But it continues on because Jesus makes three more statements. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And here it is. Jarius' world is about to come to a screeching stop. It's the moment in the movie where they blur out the background, they focus in on this protagonist, and the music changes, and maybe it's just silence in that movie, right? They told him, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them, and he said, don't be afraid, just have faith. There's an iteration of this, these two phrases that carry all the way through our scriptures. In moments where our faith is tested and the trial is huge and the suffering is great and we're feeling overwhelmed and we're not sure how we're going to be able to do what God is calling us to do and we're just burdened by everything that is just weighing us down, time and time again, God breaks into the world and he makes some iteration of this. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. He keeps, God just keeps breaking in. He's like, I understand how bad the storm is, but I'm just telling you, hang in there. Continue to trust me. We're going to get through this storm because God does speak to us to give courage to the discouraged. It's one of the reasons why we pray. Then Jesus stopped the crowd. He's at Jairus' house. Won't let anyone with him except Peter, James, and John. Jesus did this at times. It was an intimate moment, a brokenhearted father. And he didn't want to have a crowd of people. He wanted to give this man the decency of some privacy. He takes in with him three of his most trusted disciples to experience in a, an incredible moment. And obviously this moment expands out beyond these three because we get it recorded in three different Gospels. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw commotion and weeping and wailing. So in that day when somebody died, the community responded. You know, like today, we show up with a casserole, and then you get a freezer full of frozen lasagna, right? But in that day, and in that age, the community mourned with you. And when they mourned, I saw this once. It was an amazing experience. I saw it in a, in a Latin service. It was just a Latin family, Latino family. And they just were pouring out their grief. I can remember standing in that booth because a, a son and a daughter had died in a car accident. We hosted the funeral, and this place was packed with people from the community and from churches. And this father was crying out in such brokenness and the eulogy to his child. I was in that booth praying that he would stop because the weight of his grief was so palpable. And that's what it would be like in that room. They even hide, there were professional mourners who came in to kind of boost up the morning. And because he's a community leader, this place is filled with grief. But when Jesus walks into grief, he wants to dispel it. And so Jesus walks in and into this grief that is overwhelming and choking people, he says, why all this commotion and weeping? Child isn't dead, she's only asleep. A lot of commentary around that from scholars all over the world. Well, maybe she really wasn't dead. Maybe she was in a coma. Maybe she was just really sick. It doesn't matter because to the world around her, she was dead. And what we think is like, well, you know, well, she's only sick. It's not such a great miracle. Wake up. In that day and age, there are accounts of burying people who were in comas or death-like illnesses. This is a huge moment. And look at what Jesus does. Jesus walks into grief and he gives hope. The, the thing is, and this is what's amazing, right, is Mark goes on to say the crowd laughed at him. Jesus comes to bring hope to the grieving and the world laughs at him because we don't understand the power and the compassion of Jesus. We feel the poignancy and the pain of our suffering. So we think God does not love me and we mock the hope that others have. We disregard the peace that they have, the joy that they may find in circumstances we attribute to just being insane with grief. 
or shock. But Jesus walks into a situation of intense grief because he understands the hope that he has, the peace that he can provide, and even the joy that we can find in the midst of our trials and sufferings. And he seeks to dispel our grief because Jesus hates death. That's clear from the Gospels. He make, so he makes the crowd leave. Why have them stand there? They don't, want to, they don't believe in his power. They don't believe in the miracles. So why even have them say, isn't it remarkable that our lack of faith can dismiss a miracle in our lives? And so Jesus has them leave the house. He keeps the disciples who trust him. He keeps the father and the mother, like the intimate family there who reached out to him in, in tragedy for their trust. Because I'll tell you this much, you don't have to have strong faith to pray. You just have to be willing to try. And then not give up. When, when at first, you know that old saying, at first you don't succeed, try and try again. It's a great principle to pray. So Jesus makes them leave. He took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, it's an Aramaic phrase, which means, little girl, get up. And with those four words, Jesus brought hope. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed, totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders to not tell anyone what, what had happened because he just, he's trying to do his job. He doesn't want to be distracted. And then he told them, you know what? She's probably hungry. Give her something to eat. Isn't it amazing that Jesus cares about the base needs that we should... Jesus cares about children. He cares about a family in grief. He wants to lift the burden from a child to give her life. He cares about her needs of hunger and, and health. He wants to respond with compassion and to bring life back to her. And this is a miracle story. Because the first church couldn't explain it. You know what we think? Sometimes 21st century Americans, we're awfully arrogant. And I just say that because I've been in places around the world, right? And we're arrogant. You know what we think? Well, there were simple-minded people from the first century. No, they're not. We still study the philosophy of that age. But beyond that, they would read this and they go, wait a minute. They had the same doubts that we had. And the gospel writers are just laying it out for us. This is what we experienced. They're men of integrity who wrote these four Gospels. They understood that people were going to mock them, reject them, even persecute them for what they wrote. But what they had is this commitment to truth. And so their sense was, I just got to tell it and let it stand for itself. A woman was healed after 12 years of suffering. A dead child was brought back to life. And as hard as it is for you to believe that, it's what we experienced. And I don't know what to say. But I really think what they're trying to say to here is that we got a God who just doesn't have tremendous power. He has equal compassion. Because Jesus took the time to listen and act when he's in the midst of teaching. He got up to follow the Father. He refused to leave a desperate woman behind. He breaks the rules of compassion. You don't touch bleeding people. You don't touch corpses. Those are just social taboos. But I follow Jesus because the writings of his life teach me that Jesus immersed himself in our suffering to bring us hope. And while he was alive, while he was alive, he used his power to bring that hope to us in tangible ways that would inspire us to follow him. If you're here, there's a reason why you're sitting in this room today and you needed to hear this message. That power is still present today. Here's the story of a government worker who discovered it. My name is Lucas Ferreira. I'm a recent graduate from Worcester State University. I work for the town of Hoppington in the IT department. I love puzzles, cooking, and philosophical discussions. I grew up in a Catholic Brazilian family, but I don't feel like I understood the words of Christ until I sought out an English-speaking church. I was raised by a single mom and a grandmother. As a child, I struggled with depression and not knowing where I really belonged. I reached a low point in my young life and felt suicidal. That night I cried myself to sleep, praying to God to be rescued from my pain. I was able to make friends at school and my feelings of hopelessness went away. As a teenager, the depression returned and I knew I needed spiritual help. 
I reached out to different nonprofit groups in my area and started to volunteer my time. I developed an understanding of humility and patience, which helped me to see the strength of Christ working inside me. I thought less and less about my own loneliness and more about how I could help the other lonely people I encountered. I underwent an important surgery and while recovering, I decided I needed to develop a personal relationship with Christ. I have spent the past two years dedicated to growing my understanding of who Christ is and what he called on me to do. In that time, I hit highs and lows spiritually and emotionally. I was baptized as a baby, but today I am ready to dedicate my life to Christ and offer him all of my days. I want to thank everyone who helped me study the Bible these past two years and prayed for me. I know and trust that everything I've been through will be used for God's glory. Look at it, if you're here and you got questions about Christ, we're a church that loves skeptics and doubters. And we have a group called Starting Point that helps people ask questions and explore what we believe. And we would invite you into that. But I understand that for a lot of us, we say, you know, Mike, I've prayed important prayers and I've had that desperation. I didn't get the answer that that father got or that woman got. So why didn't God answer my prayers like that? Well, there's a few reasons and none of these are gonna, it may not be sufficient because they require real in-depth conversation of your struggles and we're willing to have that conversation. Stop at the hub and we'll tell you how to connect. Jesus did these miracles in that day and age because he was proving who he was. He was giving strength and courage to his disciples and those who would follow him to say, if he can do that, then he must be who he says he is, the Son of God. I think that's what Matthew's trying to show us. And honestly, he does do miracles like that in sections of the world. I've been around the world in the places often where people don't go. They're not on the tourist journey. Even places like our recent relationship with a country called Madagascar, where they talk about areas of the bush where they're planting churches. They've planted like 5,000 churches with a half a million believers. And what they said is, we've seen the sick healed. When you're in, they said, we do not rely on medicine because we don't have it. Which caused me to, causes me to reflect. I'm a guy who is getting treatment for my cancer. And I am praying. I'm a guy who believes in the power of medicine and prayer. But sometimes I think as Americans, we trust more in medicine than we do in prayer. Not that we shouldn't go to doctors. Don't, let me, don't take that away from this. I'm getting treatment. And I'm going to be taking medication for years because of my condition. And I pray trusting that God will sometimes do more than what I expect because the answers that I've learned that I have received aren't always the ones I seek. It's in the midst of my trials and suffering that God refines my character. I've had some of my most intimate and powerful moments of God in the midst of hardship. He surrounded me with a community of people, some who drive me in for treatment and have experienced that type of love. I have read the scriptures and I've seen God through the eyes of those who suffer. You know what I consistently find? A stronger faith because of it. And it reminds me, I had a great conversation with a good friend yesterday in the parking lot of Ace Hardware. <laughs> Suffering reminds me to not be content with this world. It's not my stop, it's not my stopping place. I'm on my way to somewhere far better than this. And suffering reminds me to not settle in here, but to look to the future. But here's another thing. You know what they call the church? They call it the body of Christ. And when we say, where is Jesus in my world today? Right here in this room. And in every church where people gather who love Christ, that is the body of Christ. And here's what else I've learned around the world. God answers prayer with the, through the power and compassion of a church that is devoted to Jesus. We saw this during the pandemic when people who were struggling to put food into their cabinets in order to feed their kids in Framingham and Madagascar, and this church gathered tens of thousands of dollars. We think between those two programs, Neighbors Helping Neighbors in Framingham and Neighbors Helping Neighbors in Madagascar, probably $100,000 came in during that period. 
as we poured out food to people that were in need. And you know what they said to us? I was praying to God because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I came here and you answered my prayer. That's what they said in Madagascar. There was one woman who reported to the church because we just gave the food to churches. and We said, don't tell them we gave it to you. Tell them you're giving it to them. And there was, woman, there was one woman who came and she said, I had two kids. I had no food for a day. I thought, I didn't know what we were going to do. I was afraid we were going to starve. And this church gave me food. You're an answer to my prayers. Why doesn't God answer prayer? Why are we sitting in our seats? Sometimes you're the answer. And God is saying, look up. Have the courage to engage. Know the names of your neighbors. Understand the struggles of your co-workers. Be brave enough with your fellow classmates. Get to know their world. Get to talk with them about their world. Understand what their suffering is. Because you're the compassion. You can be the power. You might be the answer to prayer. You're the hand, the voice, the touch of God to people who just need hope. And for some people, you're going to be the courage that gets them through this world and past death and into the next. Because the church is the body of Christ. Are you willing to be the answer?